Pakistan did not have the capacity uh, to return these loans and to benefit from them. So there was a great deal of uh, doubt and hesitation in China about the CPEC itself. But the overall relationship is a strategic one. And you know, it is also from China's point of view, a cheap uh, and low cost way of containing India. Welcome to Strat News Global. I'm Ramanandla Sen Gupta. Our very, very special guest today is Ambassador Ajay Bisaria, former High Commissioner to Pakistan, who's been in the news lately because of this incredible book that he's written called Anger Management. For anybody who's interested in what's going on in the subcontinent, I would recommend that you pick up your copy right away. Thank you so much for joining us today, sir. I appreciate your taking time out. Thank you for having me, Ram. Thank you. So let's let's start right from the top. Um, you know, this book is clearly a labor of love and a, a lot of research. And it must have involved a lot of, you know, sacrifices and of course a discipline. How much sacrifices did you have to make to sort of, you know, regarding your family life, your personal life, your golf, things like that. And be in the process of research, did any notions about, any personal notions about Pakistan or diplomacy sort of change? You know, this book is uh, very much a fruit of the COVID lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, I, after finishing my tenure in Pakistan, I went uh, as Indian High Commissioner to Canada. That's right. And we were soon hit by COVID. So, I, I was fielding a lot the question of what do Indian diplomats do in Pakistan? And uh, when I decided to write about it, I, I wanted to read about it. And, you know, I spent a couple of years uh, reading about uh, what my predecessors had gone to uh, particularly. And uh, I think uh, that is what triggered it. And I said, it's such an interesting story. It must be told. And uh, somewhere along the line, I tried to tell the story of the entire sweep of 76 years of the relationship. Mm -hmm. But you're right. Uh, there are a lot of ideas of mine and notions which I changed in the writing and looking at the research because the the cyclicality of the relationship is something that strikes you that you know we go through good times and bad times and are there any general pointers towards what we do to uh, improve the relationship or uh, what mistakes we don't repeat which makes a uh, relationship plunge mm -hmm. and I, I did uh, come to one conclusion that there are many structural factors in the relationship that make it very hard uh, to, uh, to improve matters. Right. And uh, we need in this relationship to be constantly creating uh, diplomacy and to be creative about how to deal, uh, particularly in India's case with Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, because India has more, I think, creative space in the diplomacy than Pakistan does, which is led by the structural factor of the army right. dominating everything and dominating the narrative and dominating the discourse. Mm -hmm. Whereas India has more space mm -hmm. uh, in, in dealing with this relationship. So I think um, it is a complex relationship and uh, it is important to see what we've done and the errors we've made in the past in order not to repeat them. Yes, sir. You know, you mentioned that it's a cyclical relationship and that, you know, uh, which, is, which is actually quite true. Part of that seems to be a notion that, you know, that India will bluster a lot, go into chest thumping and then, you know, say, let's play cricket. I think that used to be the notion earlier. Now we have obviously taken a much firmer stand. In your book, you also refer to, you know, people like mm, Mani Dixit, the Lamba having a rather hard line sort of a policy towards it. I mean, advocating a rather hardline policy. And you also have people who are advocating more softer, more, uh, how would I say it, a nuanced stand. And you yourself said that anything that we do has to be sort of rooted through the army first, because they are actually the people in charge, keeping, of course, the civilian government. Thing. But given that the army is, or let's call it the deep state, given that they their entire existence is dependent on this India bogey. How difficult is that to do, to just keep on, you know, how much can we trust them? I think that's a very valid point. And uh, what, you know, your, your question raises two issues. One is, 
about whether there is diplomatic space in mm -hmm. this relationship. And the notion that diplomats always carry is that there is space for diplomacy. That we could do some smart diplomacy in order to change the trajectory of the relationship. So there is space for diplomacy, but there is also there are also severe limits to diplomacy. And that we have not been able to recognize very clearly and clear-headedly in this relationship. So, for instance, uh, I make the point that uh, diplomacy can be useful up to a point beyond which one has to use kinetic or military means and uh, because of the kind of challenges you face mm -hmm. and particularly the challenge of terrorism. So uh, there is a reason uh, for diplomats or so diplomats should be alive to the fact that diplomacy has its limits mm -hmm. and at times you need to in a situation use force or coercive diplomacy as well as a tool of, uh, of expressing your national interest and, and trying to change the behavior of the other adversarial state. Mm -hmm. uh, the other point you raise is about policy. So have all Indian diplomats agreed on the kind of policy you should have for Pakistan? So we may, uh, a lot of uh, times we agree on the analysis mm -hmm. of what is wrong with Pakistan, the dominance of the army, the structural factors and so on. But we don't always agree on the policy response we should have. Right. And, and that is what you refer to. And I, I tried to see what uh, my predecessors had recommended as policy when they wrote their memoirs, wrote their books. And uh, you could clearly see that there was a spectrum of views. So there was the hardliners who advocated a very hard position on Pakistan. And there were those who were the so-called doves in the aviary who, who recommended a softer approach. But uh, where I come out personally and where a few others have come out is saying that, you know, you have to have a nuanced, creative approach somewhere in the center that takes in both a hard power approach mm -hmm. and a diplomatic approach. The need for uh, being tough, for instance, on terrorism and at the same time being open to uh, creative uh, diplomacy. And, and one of the recommendations I would certainly make is that given the army's predominance in Pakistan's power structure, we should uh, have a continuous engagement with the army. And uh, we should, uh, in fact, uh, whenever we are talking to the civilians, for whatever reason, and come up with ideas, we should triangulate that with the army and ensure that the army is on board. Mm -hmm. Because several times in this relationship, uh, we have talked only to civilians Oh, uh, to find later that the army was not on board and was actively trying to sabotage right. uh, what the civilians were doing. So uh, perhaps learning from all these um, errors of the past, we need a more clear-headed approach about what Pakistan is. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I understand what you're saying, but you know, uh, my question was somewhat different. Okay, let me put it another way. You know, the army seems to be taking its playbook from China, where they're now getting into the civilian space as well, just as directors of various. Right. institutions, civilian institutions right. as well. So it's becoming increasingly difficult to sort of separate the two. Right. Um, there is an argument to be made that by sort of talking to the army, you're actually undermining a civilian administration. How uh, valid is that argument? So, you know, I would contest that argument by saying that India's business of India's foreign policy is to promote its national interest. Mm -hmm. Um, and therefore, we have to deal with Pakistan the way it is rather than it, the way it should be right. in our interest or the interest of its people. Mm -hmm. Of course, democracy is welcome. Of course, a good democracy is better than a bad democracy. But if you have a country which is run by an army or a communist party, mm -hmm. um, however much you would like it to be otherwise, you would have to deal with that institution. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we dealt with Pakistan in the Musharraf years or all the 30 years Pakistan had, uh, had uh, dictators. We dealt with those dictators. Right. The fact is that even when Pakistan doesn't have a dictator in the front office, that dictator is present in the back office. Very much so. Uh, being either the puppeteer of the civilians or, or deeply influencing foreign and security policy. Mm -hmm. So we must recognize that reality about Pakistan and in formulating our policy or our tactical approach, recognize that we should be talking to this 
central and primary power institution of uh, of uh, Pakistan. Absolutely, I mean that's similar to what we do with, let's say, places like Myanmar or wherever else we, do. Absolutely. we talk to the people in charge. Yeah, because there's no point talking to somebody who doesn't have that clout. Uh, let's talk about Imran Khan. You know, he evokes mixed reactions all over the world. I think um, people either love him or hate him. Or in Pakistan, I think he's quite popular at the moment. You met him, I believe, a couple of times, or whatever it is. But I'll come to your personal views on that later. But more importantly, um, do you think the way the PTI was sidelined and the way those, you know, the unrest that followed Imran's arrest and all that, I think his followers just seem to walk into military inst installations, which is very strange, if you ask me. Even in regular times, military installations would be very heavily guarded. So, and then the fact that in the recent elections his sort of people seem to have taken a quite a large sizable chunk of the vote. Does that undermine the army structure in any way? You know, the army is dealing with something new. It's dealing with a kind of street power it had not experienced before. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in, in uh, rigging the 2024 election so brazenly as it did, what the army had as a model was the 2018 election. Right where what it did simply was a lot of pre-election engineering. It had cases against Nawaz Sharif, put him in jail, promoted Imran Khan a bit, and Imran Khan won, you know. So this is what they had expected this time. What was different was that there was a, a wave of popular support for Imran Khan, for which the army itself was partly responsible because there was an anti-army mood as well. Mm -hmm for the way the army had uh, both brazenly rigged the election and dealt with the 9th May uh, events that you're referring right. to last year yes. uh, and so on. And uh, the army itself uh, had got a little confused, particularly in the transition between Bajwa and Asim Munir. Mm -hmm. and, and we can, so you know, their response to the 9th May uh, arrest of Imran Khan and the subsequent rioting was very hesitant. They did not want to use force. And of course, the uh, chasms within the army and the different views within the army, the sympathy for Imran Khan were also apparent. Mm -hmm. So all this um, became apparent, particularly during the, uh, the 9th May events. And here uh, in the 8th February elections that we just saw recently, uh, there was a glimpse of uh, what the election results would actually have been. Right. Uh, which was a vote favoring Imran Khan and his uh, independence uh, since right. the symbol was taken away mm -hmm. from the PTI. But the fact is that one month down the line, the army is back to being in charge. There was a weak moment where it couldn't control everything because, mm -hmm. you know, the army is not always in control of the situation. It tries to improvise uh, its reactions. but. Clearly, the empire has struck back. They are back in business uh, and, uh, you know, they have what they wanted, which is a political landscape, which, which is uh, minus Imran and also minus Nawaz. And course, yes, they have a weak uh, coalition in play, which will be completely dependent on them. Mm -hmm. And they are hoping that Imran Khan, either by cajoling him or giving him a deal, or in some shape or form will be uh, uh, bottled and the Imran challenge will go away and you would have in play a political government which is beholden to the army mm -hmm. and therefore the army uh, will be in charge of the situation mm -hmm. in the coming couple of years except that they can't manage the economy and Absolutely, they've been yes. part of the problem that the economy faces. Mm -hmm. So that is the most severe challenge. The political challenge is something that the army can control. The security and economic challenge is the poly crisis that it has to grapple with. I can understand the army trying to deal with the security part of it because that would be their ambit. But the economic part of it, I suppose, they would have to sort of look to a civilian government to deal with. Well, try telling it to the army. They really believe that <laughs> they know everything. Mm -hmm. So they have uh, created this institution of the SIFC, 
the special yes, in investment course, facilitation yes. council which has the army chief also as a member mm -hmm. so uh, somewhere along the line i think uh, we have to understand the way the army looks at it and in the past famously uh, benazir uh, bhutto had pointed out that the army looked at its itself as the defender of the ideological frontiers of pakistan right uh, along the way, the Bajwa doctrine said, and they realized that there was a 10x differential between India and Pakistan, and Pakistan's economy was sinking, making the army weaker, the country weaker. So they said there should be a primacy to geoeconomics as against geopolitics, which means that you've got to strengthen the state to have a strong army. So the army felt that uh, the economy sinking further is not in Pakistan's security interest either. Mm -hmm. So, I think for that reason, it involves itself in, in uh, governing the economy either by military inc, which is, uh, you know, more than $20 billion of direct control on the economy mm -hmm. through its various Fauji foundations and running PIA, but indirectly also uh, in uh, controlling the economy in so many different ways mm -hmm. by controlling the land, the defense lands and so on. That it has become part of the problem that led the economy into such uh, dire straits mm -hmm. uh, and somehow it seems to believe that it can be part of the solution rather than leaving that to civilian governments to do deep structural reforms. Mm -hmm. So we, we were talking about Imran Khan, you met him a couple of times, what would be your first impression about him? You know, when I met uh, Imran Khan, I did not see him as a very anti-India person. He spoke very warmly about India and the times he played cricket in India, the number of friends he had in India and uh, very positively about the Indian cricket team and even about Indian politics. He told me in a meeting four days before he became Prime Minister that India has managed its coalition system so well and that is what a diverse country like India needs. But somewhere along the line, I think his inexperience showed and particularly after Article 370, mm -hmm. he was so inexperienced uh, that he took on such a hard line position that he found it hard to get off the tiger and, uh, you know, take a very strong position against India's leaders personally to personalize uh, the situation, to talk about Jammu and Kashmir as a, as a deal breaker in the relationship. So I think all that made him the, reduce the diplomatic space uh, mm -hmm. uh, for him as well as for his successor governments which were so weak. So what you need in Pakistan is a stronger government or at least a government with a strong uh, backing by the army to be able to uh, you know change that narrative and uh, get on to a position of giving itself space uh, in dealing with India. In fact I remember being surprised once hearing that you know General Bajwa was for peace and Imran Khan said no. So, I mean, has that sort of reversed the whole... Yes, that was certainly the dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in that the army itself, uh, particularly the time I was there, seemed to favour a better relationship with mm -hmm. India. And you would have seen the various leaks that emerged after the Imran Bajwa divorce. Right. Uh, you know, there were various media leaks and one of which said that uh, Bajwa was even uh, in conversation through various back channels to say there could be a 20-year freeze on the Kashmir yes. problem. And, uh, and so it was a pragmatic understanding of the power differential and dealing with India in enlightened self-interest of Pakistan to say that uh, war or confrontation with India was not in the interest of Pakistan. Uh, whereas uh, Imran Khan was not buying it and, uh, you know, uh, he, he had taken a position which he did not want to step back from. So it was an uh, odd situation and uh, completely reversed, as you said, because, you know, traditionally it was the civilians who wanted to make good with India and the army which felt it was not in their interest to mm -hmm. do it. But it was reversed in Imran Khan's time. It was that the, the, the army seemed uh, keen but hesitant because uh, of being in a phase of transition particularly before Bajwa's um, you know, uh, extension of his term was coming up and so on. But uh, the civilians seemed to be questioning that, mm -hmm. that path. I have you know, about 20,000 more questions based on <laughs> what I read on the book. So, but I'll uh. conclude with two quick last questions. 
One is that, you know, the China factor. I think China is having problems with CPEC and things like that. They've sort of, I think, I wouldn't say second thoughts, they've invested a lot of money there. Is there a way for India to leverage that, number one? And, um, you know, or, or do you really think that, you know, China is having second thoughts? Because that's my opinion from what I've read. That's the first question. And then, I mean, then of course, what do you, what do you see next? What do you see happening next? You know, on the China piece, I think there are two parts to your question. Mm -hmm. One is the CPEC. Right. As an instrument of uh, the newest strategic relationship between China and Pakistan. So, yes, CPEC seems to have failed because uh, there were a lot of articles uh, periodically, even in the Pakistani media, which said, is CPEC dead? Because it was envisaged as a $64 billion project yes. and with multiple uh, projects of different natures. Uh, one, one arm going into Punjab and the other into Balochistan, up to Gwadar. Um, but the Chinese halted it at about $22, $24 billion because they felt that this was throwing good money after bad. Mm -hmm. The returns were getting bad, um, there was danger to the projects in Baluchistan, they were not being uh, protected enough and uh, they certainly felt that Pakistan did not have the capacity uh, to return these loans and to benefit from them. So there was a great deal of uh, doubt and hesitation in China about the CPEC itself. But the overall relationship is a strategic one and you know it is also from China's point of view a cheap uh, and low cost way of containing India. Mm -hmm. The strategic partnership that they developed right from the 60s uh, has now been bolstered by a relationship of complete economic dependence. So there was a strategic partnership or a strong strategic interest in containing India for, mm -hmm. uh, for both the countries. Uh, add to that that China was responsible for Pakistan's nuclear program, its air program, its defense program and uh, everything else and then China became, uh, Pakistan became dependent on China mm -hmm. for uh, its economic survival. So the, much of the debt of uh, external debt of Pakistan today is from China and China is the lender of last resort. Uh, so. Uh, so the de dependence is huge and uh, China's use for a vassal state is also high. So the relationship isn't going anywhere. You might tactically change your BRI CPEC into another uh, sort of means. But what India needs to prepare for is both a diplomatic and military answer to a collusion between these two states mm -hmm. in the future. What we keep talking about, a two-front war and things like Absolutely, that. a two-front war, a unified front war. I mean, uh, we need to be militarily prepared for it and diplomatically prepared to counter it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that is one. On what happens in the future of Pakistan, uh, I think uh, the most immediate challenge they have is to get this 24th IMF loan of $6 billion because with that is required uh, for survival and Shabazz Sharif has called it a problem higher than the Himalaya because that is uh, clearly a huge problem. I think the political problems will be solved because the army will give the support to Shabazz Sharif. Uh, and as long as he has the pleasure of Asim Munir, the army chief, he will remain prime minister. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think the next stage of political drama might come 18 months later when Asim Munir comes up for his extension after his three-year term. Right. And till then, it's likely that this government continues. Of course, uh, there is speculation that uh, Bilawal Bhutto is waiting in the wings, Yes. Uh, the Gen next uh, Prime Minister, and there could be a decision then to, uh, if uh, Shabazz Sharif isn't performing to the satisfaction of the army, to flip him and have uh, the PPP Prime Minister led by uh, Bilawal because they haven't joined this government uh, right. at, at this they're, point they're of time. Supporting it from outside. Supporting from outside. So I think uh, Pakistan will continue in its poly crisis. Mm -hmm. There would be an illusion of political stability because uh, the army backing this PDM uh, government or this PMLN government uh, and uh, Imran Khan's challenge will be contained by keeping him in jail or doing a deal with him. 
So mm -hmm. I think what we are going to see is uh, an illusion of stability, but a Pakistan still facing severe challenges on the economic and security front, uh, security front from the TTP and from the West. So India is not the number one challenge. No, as I said, I still have so many questions to ask, but we have run out of time. Thank you so very much, sir. I think uh, that was a very clear sort of explanation on your book, of course, which again, I recommend everybody pick up whoever's interested in the subcontinent or actually diplomacy per se. Um, I do look forward to having you again with us sometime, sir. It'd be Happy to do that. Happy to do a deep dive. Yes, sir. That would be a wonderful thing to do. Um, that was High Commissioner and Ambassador Ajay Bissaria, who's done stints in Canada and Pakistan, talking to us about his incredible book called Anger Management and about the recent situation in Pakistan. I do hope you enjoyed this show. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.